Thank you. Each year at the Ethical Society, we organize our programs around a theme. Our theme this year is Building an Ethical Future. In September, we are exploring the future of communication. To speak to that theme, it's my pleasure now to introduce Matthew Fasciani, who will give a talk on how to have productive conversations in a world full of misinformation. Dr. Fasciani received his MA and PhD in sociology from the University of South Carolina. His research areas include media literacy, misinformation, and political polarization. Fasciani's forthcoming book, Misguided, describes the psychological and sociological processes that explain why we are susceptible to political and health misinformation. We are delighted to have him talk with us virtually this morning. Great. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen and get into my talk. All right, so today I'm going to be giving some strategies on how we can best have productive conversations in a world full of misinformation. So as many of us have probably experienced, it's often really hard to talk with people we disagree with. And the good news is that social science can help and it can give us some evidence based strategies to at least have a more productive dialogue. So the focus of these steps is not so much to change minds or persuade people but just to try to best ensure that we are being heard and we're having a productive conversation with someone who might have a different viewpoint than us or maybe has fallen for misinformation. So we're trying to just have a conversation where we feel like both parties are listening to each other as best they can. And before I get into these steps, I'd like to just briefly talk about the power of identity and how this can shape our information processing. So identities, are just a set of meanings for navigating our social world. And we all have hundreds of them. So examples can be being a parent, being a daughter, being a son, being a colleague, being a sports fan. All of these types of identities help us navigate our social environments. And oftentimes, we don't have to worry about their intersections with misinformation. But there's a few examples where that they can definitely have an impact. So when we think about identity and identity theory, we can think about this identity feedback loop where when we hold an important identity, we're motivated to maintain consistency between the values and the meanings associated with that identity and our behavior and how we process the world. So this is called identity verification, where we're motivated to support these identities. One example could be if we work in a coffee shop and let's say we have an identity of a barista where we really take pride in making these beautiful lattes for our customers. Well, in this case, we're motivated to keep making these great coffees because it makes us feel good because this identity is important to us. Now, this process can be problematic whenever we introduce different types of identities that can change how we process factual information. So for example, political identities can bias us to interpret the world in a way that is consistent with our political identities. So we may be more likely to share information that supports our in-group or attacks the out-group. And this can make us biased in how we process that information but it also can perpetuate certain types of biased information out into the world. And beyond this process of identity, these identities also intersect with our networks. So we know that people like to associate with others that are similar to us. This is called homophily. And just to focus on Democrats and Republicans again, we know that both of these groups tend to have more politically homogeneous networks. So a lot of the people they associate with are similar to them politically. These are two graphs of Facebook uh, profiles of a uh, typical Democrat and Republican. The blue dots are Democrat friends, the red dots are Republican friends. And you can probably guess which is which profile. And studies have shown that on social media, we also tend to associate with people who are thinking like us politically. And these numbers have only risen over time. Now, 
why does this matter as far as identity processing? Well, not only are we receiving information that is very similar to our ideologies if we're in a feedback loop of people who think like us, but whenever we're in this echo chamber of people who share our beliefs, they can behave in ways that actually uh, further perpetuate this identity verification through a mutual identity verification. So if I'm sharing something on Facebook to support my identity and lots of people in my Facebook also share that same identity, then this process is going to reinforce itself. And we can see that people who have these uh, information uh, networks that are very similar to their own tend to be even more polarized because it's like a feedback loop within a feedback loop. So not only are we motivating ourselves to support our own identity, but when we're around people who have that same identity, those types of behaviors that they're doing can further verify and support the identity that we have. So that's just a brief overview of identities and how networks can facilitate the identity verification process. And now for um, now we can think about how this can influence how we perceive different groups. So as we, you probably have been seeing uh, in the United States, we're seeing an increase of political polarization. In this graph, we see that uh, in the 1980s, people generally were viewing their own political party more warmly compared to the out group. But on this feeling thermometer of how warm you feel between the two groups, there's only about a 25 degree difference. Over time, we're seeing this stronger and stronger uh, divide occur, where now it's only uh, about 25 degrees towards the out group, so about a 50 degrees difference of feeling negatively towards that group. And as we were talking about before, once we have these strong uh, identities and feelings towards different groups, it can change how we process information. In fact, one of the few things that Democrats and Republicans agree on is that they can't agree on basic facts, as this survey uh, shows uh, from 2019, that Democrats and Republicans are both seeing the world uh, in very different lenses. And there's plenty of examples on this. Uh, you know, one of the most salient ones that we've been going through the last couple of years has been the response to COVID. So in, with COVID-19, Democrats and Republicans have viewed the virus very differently and how to uh, tackle the virus very differently. Even with the rollout of the vaccine, we're seeing these partisan divides on how we process information. So given that we have this landscape of political polarization that fuels misinformation, I'd like to provide a few steps on how we can at least try to have more productive conversations. Again, these are not steps to try to persuade someone, but before you even get to that point to just make sure your, your point is being processed in a way that has the best chance of being heard. And these steps are respect, relate, reframe, revise, and repeat. So I'm going to go through each of these steps and share how they can be helpful. So the first step is to establish respect for each other. So this is a mutual respect that can be really helpful when we start having these types of difficult conversations. And research supports this because when people feel respected and heard, they avoid their defensive biases, they feel more satisfied with the conversation. And whenever we do this process, what can be helpful is to think about listening as an active and collaborative process. So seeking to understand where they're coming from, resisting the urge to judge, and constantly being curious about how they've come to these different viewpoints can be really helpful in establishing respect for each other. The inverse is true also. So if we don't have respect for each other, it can really hurt these types of conversations. In fact, there's research showing that just being exposed to the opposing ideology on social media, such as Twitter, can actually increase polarization. So merely just having exposure to different viewpoints might not always be helpful depending on how they're presented. Some of the research that I've done has shown that whenever people develop meaningful social connections with people who hold different viewpoints, this is actually associated with a reduction of polarization. And one example of this is with climate change, where children can actually be particularly effective in changing their parents' minds about climate change compared to strangers and other people. Of course, 
this respect for each other does go both ways. So as Dr. Catherine Hayo talks about here, uh, the key ingredient for constructive conversations is mutual respect. And she talks about how if the other person isn't respecting us, then maybe we should move on to someone who's going to give us that respect. So she spends a lot of time talking about climate change and talking about climate change to various different communities. And sometimes these can be very challenging conversations, but we only have a finite amount of resources. So if someone's not respecting us, we can use those resources on someone who maybe is more open. So this goes into our next step. So just as Catherine Hayo, she talks to lots of different communities about climate change. Sometimes she'll use her own uh, religious identity to connect with other religious groups. This is a very helpful step because relating to a shared identity can also be very helpful for having productive conversations. So whenever we think about our shared identity here, there's research showing that highlighting a common group identity can actually reduce division and bias and people are more receptive to information from in-group members. So research has shown that focusing on a common American identity can actually reduce political bias. And other research has shown that whenever people are paired as discussion partners over time, those who have different political beliefs tend to reduce their polarization if they can bond on a common interest first. So if they start talking about sports or music and what they have in common in those areas, research has shown that this has actually been helpful for reducing polarization later on. Dr. Ray Maktoufi is a science communicator who has this great empathy workshop that she does where she asks people to role play different points of view. And she talks about being engaging, not dismissive. So this relates back to step one. But I also like how she focuses on talking about things you have in common. So in this graph, she mentions how you might not have religion in common, you might not have uh, fishing in common, but maybe you're both parents and can talk about your children. And before you even get into the stuff you disagree with, having conversations about what you have in common can be really helpful. So after we related to the different identities of the person we're talking with, another step is to reframe the conversation to address their concerns. So I really like these quotes from Emily Calandrelli. She's a science communicator and aerospace engineer. I asked her about how, what are some main takeaways she's had from talking to all these different groups of people about science over the years. And as you can see here, she talks about the focus on your audience and how even though it, it sounds very straightforward, sometimes we forget to think about what the audience that we're talking to, what they care about. We forget what our audience cares about because sometimes we're only seeing the positions we're advocating for through the lens that we care about. And sometimes if we reframe the conversation, it may be more productive and it may be better able to understand where we're coming from. So one way to do this is thinking about what are the different values that people have. There's research showing that liberals tend to especially care about fairness and reducing harm, whereas conservatives especially care about purity, loyalty, and liberty. So people generally care about all of these, but here are some different areas where different groups are especially more likely to play, place emphasis on these different values. And research has shown that whenever you frame different positions in a way that is consistent with these values, people are more open to them. So for example, conservatives are more likely to support pro-environmental legislation when it's framed in terms of purity rather than harm. Additionally, liberals are more likely to support military spending when it's framed in terms of how it can help poor people. Also, there's research showing that there's different messaging that can make conservative white evangelicals more likely to support wearing masks. So one study showed that whenever the experiment shows a religious message equating mask use to loving your neighbor or a message from Donald Trump saying mask use is patriotic, people were more likely to endorse wearing masks after they saw these messages. So coming from the perspective of 
different values that they care about can be helpful. And this also intersects with relating to a shared identity as well. So after we've related to an identity, we've reframed the conversation, now we can start thinking about the types of language we use when we present our arguments and our positions. So this goes into revising the questions that we're sharing. And this is because when people are put in a position where they're asked to think more deliberatively, more analytically, it actually has been shown to reduce the likelihood of believing and sharing fake news. And this goes into cognitive psychology that suggests that we have these two main types of uh, thinking patterns. So type one thinking is more of a quick intuitive thought process. And type two is more about an analytical, more deliberative, slower thought process. So anytime you can get people in this type two thinking, it can actually increase the likelihood of changing their attitudes or even just be more open to information. And research has shown that whenever you ask people to be more deliberative and to reflect on their positions, even in group settings where people all agree, they tend to be more reflective and less polarized than if you just have a group of people who all agree and you don't set up that boundary from the start. So some examples of this you might be familiar with are the Socratic method, applied epistemology, simply questioning how they know what they know and asking how confident they are as well. Another way to think about this is the differences between how versus why. So asking for reasons to justify beliefs can actually increase polarization because you're not asking someone to describe the step-by-step -step mechanism of how they got to that belief. So for example, whenever people are asked just why do you believe this, uh, they can just say, well, it's true or because it resonates with me. But whenever you ask people to describe the step-by-step -step mechanism of why they support a policy or why they support a position, this does not increase polarization. And another study looked at uh, having people explain um, various apolitical issues and they were asked to explain them uh, producing reasons either using how or why. And whenever people are asked to use how when describing like um, how something works, they're much more likely to give evidence-based reasons as opposed to just asking why something works that way. And finally, this gets to the last step, which is the most simple, but also the most important. This is repeat. So research has shown that media literacy programs can reduce belief in misinformation, but the effects only last when they ha have this booster shot of media literacy. So in other words, whenever you present the media literacy intervention a few weeks later, and this is because you know people tend to forget, they revert back to their previous ideology. So it can be really important to maintain these types of conversations over time. So building positive relationships are key for productive dialogue. But of course, this takes time and energy. So it definitely can be really challenging where if we think about the, the psychological mechanisms that can increase our likelihood of having productive dialogue, these five steps can help. I do have a few important caveats before I wrap up here. Uh, one thing I'd like to address is this really great quote by Dylan Marin, who says, empathy is not endorsement. So if you're not familiar with Dylan Marin, he's an activist. He talks to a lot of different people, some who disagree with him and some who have some pretty harmful viewpoints. And what he tries to do is connect with them on a human level and try to get them to rethink their position or just connect with them. And so he has this quote about, you know, just having empathy for another person and trying to connect with them is not endorsing their views. So it can just be important if we care about connecting with someone to understand where they're coming from, but that's still not endorsing what they're saying. And of course, there's lots of other ways to enact social change. So these five steps are on one-on-one -on -one conversations if we're interested in trying to have these productive conversations. But supporting our own group is important too. So if you're not interested in trying to do these types of one-on-one uh, -on -one dialogues, which can be really draining sometimes, then of course there's other ways that we can help if we care about advocating for different social issues. 
So just to briefly share a few personal examples of me using these steps. So I have tried to use some of these steps both consciously and unconsciously in my own life. And it's been, you know, mixed uh, results. So the, these steps are helpful, but you have to really commit to using them over time. And the format really can make a difference too. So I found much more success using these types of techniques when I'm talking to someone in person. Whenever I am talking to someone online and I try to do these types of techniques, it can be much less effective. So I generally avoid social media debates in general these days. Um, also, I've done some scientific testimony where I've met with different politicians and I can try to frame my testimony in a way that maybe is going to match their politics a little bit better. But of course, I'm not necessarily establishing mutual respect or repeating these types of strategies. So there's a lot of other factors on why I might not be able to resonate with a particular politician. There's a lot of other motivations going on there. And even just giving a talk. Giving a talk is often, you know, one way. Sometimes there's Q&A at the end, which is great, but it's still hard to establish a lot of mutual respect or repeat this process over and over if you're just having a one-off conversation or talk about a particular subject. So one other cool thing about these steps is that having productive dialogue can help everyone involved. So we often struggle to recognize our own biases. So simply just talking with someone who thinks differently than us can make our own position sharper, or we can recognize when we might be falling for misinformation ourselves. And research has shown that conversations with people we trust can help us from being misled. And not only can it help us from being misled, we can then share these experiences with our networks to reduce further misperceptions. So maybe we can connect with someone who's maybe more moderate in their position and that positive productive dialogue, they can share with their own group that might have more people that think differently than the networks that we have in our group. And hopefully this, this can share and produce this effect of having uh, these productive dialogues in lots of different settings. I'd also like to briefly address the future of misinformation as well. So as information becomes more accessible, so will misinformation. And with all these rapid developments of technologies such as artificial intelligence and its ability to fake information, images, and videos, I think it's even more important to consider the human element as well. So this picture here is Mark Zuckerberg and the technology used to fake different videos. So misinformation is going to become much more sophisticated in the future. And it's going to be really important to understand why people want to believe these types of things. And if we believe they're being misled, we need to consider the human element to try to connect with them as well. So to summarize some of my current and future work, uh, right now, I'm working on a few different media literacy interventions to try to reduce misinformation. And we're trying to apply these interventions, working with a variety of groups in Southeast Asia for a cross-cultural application of them. Uh, some of the colleagues I work with at the University of Notre Dame, we're also working on what's called this misinformation early warning system. And this uses artificial intelligence to identify if people have been doctoring different mess, uh, pictures on the internet. So if someone's changed a picture and used Photoshop to change it in a way uh, you know, to spread misinformation, uh, this system we're developing can help identify this early on. And finally, I'm also finishing up my book. Uh, it's called Misguided, Where Misinformation Starts, How It Spreads, and What to Do About It. And I talk about some of these steps for productive dialogue that I addressed here, but I also go into much more depth about identities and networks and various case studies of how these types of identity processes and social processes can explain our susceptibility to misinformation, and then how can we understand those in a way to prevent it as well. So in conclusion, people often become misled because of social forces. So those same social forces can help us move back on track as well. So being able to understand why people believe what they believe because of this process of identity can be really important. And then we can use that identity process to have these productive conversations to 
try to explain our viewpoint in a way that they can hear us most effectively. So to summarize these steps again, respect the other person and having them respect you is very crucial first step. Then relating to a shared identity is also very important as is reframing the conversation in a way that addresses their concerns. Then when we were talking about the language we use, revising the types of questions can be helpful, uh, thinking about how they come to a conclusion versus just asking them why they believe something. And then finally, repeating all of these steps because it's an ongoing process to be most effective. So thank you all so much for listening and I look forward to addressing all your questions. The ushers will now take up a collection to support the society. If you are moved to make a donation today, we appreciate anything you may be able to offer. We rely on the generosity of our members and friends to ensure our community can keep providing our many free programs. If you don't have cash with you today, you can donate at ethicalstl.org slash donate, or maybe or use a QR code, which may be on the screen soon. Not sure. Or even better, become a pledging member. If you are interested in joining the Ethical Society, our membership coordinator, Laura, will be available afterwards to answer your questions. We would like to keep you informed about future events at the Ethical Society. If you'd like to join our weekly newsletter, use the QR code above me to sign up. And I do not have any additional announcements, so with that, we will go to our third and final musical selection, again performed by Dave Black. This last piece is a composition of mine titled Papillon, which is French for butterfly.
Thank you, Dave, for such beautiful music. And thank you, everyone, for being here today, for each other and for yourselves. After this meeting, we invite you to continue your day with us. You can stay in this room, join us for a conversation, con uh, wow, join us for a discussion. That word, the word I was trying to say wasn't even on the script. I don't know what happened there. Join us for a discussion of the talk right here in this room. You can ask our speaker your questions. If you're joining us online, just type your questions into the chat and we will read them and answer from here. Or if you'd prefer to find out more about the many opportunities for connection, growth, and inspiration here at the Society, join us downstairs for our annual activity fair where you can learn about all the different groups and programs we offer here. If you're new and would like people to say hi while you browse the booth, please pick up a yellow mug to hold your coffee. We hope today's gathering helped you feel more connected to other people, gave you new and in interesting ideas, and inspired you to think about the values which guide your life. To end our program, I invite you to greet those on either side of you, and I wish you a good week. I think if I do this, you can probably hear me, right? Yes, okay, so we can't hear you. You're, you're muted right now, but I just wanted to say you did great. Thank you so much. Please feel free to take five minutes away from your desk if you need to. We will start the Q&A at about five past. I'm, I will, at that point, put you up on the big screen. Um, I'm not sure how many people are going to stay today simply because we have our annual activity fair that is all the different groups at the Society meeting to talk about what they're going to do for the upcoming year. So it may be that the vast majority of people go downstairs to that. So please don't be offended if they do that. This is a once in a year thing which might draw people away. But I'm sure that we'll have some questions from the folks online um, if... Oh, everyone can hear me on the stream. Hello, everyone. I'm just telling Matthew he did a great job. And I'm, I think for him to hear me, you have to hear me as well. So I'm sorry about that. Um, so you did great. I'll see you in five minutes, and we will see if there are questions. I certainly have a question, so hopefully I'll be able to make it work. Okay.
Okay, Matthew, can you hear me? Is it working? It looks to me like it's working. Hello, everyone on the stream. I can see um, one comment from Bev on the stream, so we're going to start with that. Bev says, I once had a patient tell me the COVID vaccine wasn't really a vaccine. He's an educated man, an engineer, but not a biologist. I could have asked him, how did he decide the COVID vaccine was not a vaccine? But clearly this was misinformation he was fed. I did not challenge him on his position, nor did I say he had to have a vaccine to obtain care, though I did insist he wear a mask. Matthew, do you, is, is a, um, a situation like that, how might you apply your four, your five steps? Yeah, so it's a great question. Uh, it's certainly really challenging when someone has internalized so much of the misinformation. So it can be really challenging to try to reach someone in a single conversation. Um, so like for this particular person, yeah, asking them, you know, how they came to that conclusion and how they, they know that this vaccine is more dangerous than the other vaccines that are developed. So, I mean, that's a common thing is like, well, this one was rushed. I often hear that. And I think it's interesting when you ask, well, like, what is the step-by-step -step process for why that is a problem? Like, can you describe what particular aspects of the clinical trials were problematic or rushed? And then it can be tricky because that's, that's one way to help them to reflect on it. But again, that's just like the first that can be the first time that they are actually reflecting on their position. So I guess the answer to your question is it's really hard to change uh, someone's mind in a single instance like that. And all we can try to do is present them with the information and present them an opportunity to reflect on their position in a way that they might not have previously. But ultimately, if someone is constantly reading this information and, and having that internalized to an important identity of theirs. It can be really challenging uh, for them to, to update their beliefs because that means they have to reject that they were wrong or they were duped and no one ever likes to admit that. So ultimately they have to come to the conclusion that they want to change their position themselves in a way that they don't feel like they were misled. So yeah, you can try to apply these five steps, but you know, since it's a, a patient encounter too, you know, it can be really challenging for a lot of reasons and and ultimately just to talk a little bit more about like health information so much i found is these types of misguided beliefs about vaccines or covid um, often stem from a lack of trust and and also where people are getting their trust from so it can be really frustrating that someone might not want the vaccine because they don't think it's safe, but then they'll take some alternative treatment that could be just as, you know, a lot more dangerous because they don't understand, you know, how it works. But because they trust the person giving the alternative treatment, they're much more likely to avoid uh, the caution that they otherwise had with the vaccine. So trust is another central component when we think about health information as well. Great. Great, 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 great. Oh, oh no, no. hang on a second. Great. Sorry about that. Oh, wow, it's back again. I'm so confused by this. Okay, so 
thank you for that answer. We have a question here in the room from Laura. Hi. Um, I, from your own personal experience with using those steps, you indicated that you have more success in person than you do online. Uh, my understanding is that we've got our communication is, what is it, 80% nonverbal? And so is that why you have more success in person than online? Because you've got more levels of the non nonverbal communication. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think that's definitely part of it. Uh, the different levels of communication are going to definitely help you advocate your position whenever you're able to be in person. I, but I think the, the larger force here is that it's so much easier to dehumanize someone when they're just text in a picture. So it's easy to just project all of your, your, uh, your biases or your misperceptions about that group onto that person instead of viewing them as a human being. So whenever you're in a room with someone or even just you know, talking to someone virtually on the phone, you can actually hear their voice. It makes them a lot more real. It's a lot more human element. And that's, that's why I ended the, the talk today focusing on the human element and the social element, because something that I worry about is as we become more disconnected from people and we can create these types of digital technologies that are more removed from the human element, I worry that it's just going to be easier to have these really polarizing uh, discussions that aren't, aren't really discussions, just people uh, attacking each other based on the different viewpoints. And it's going to be easier to dehumanize people um, because they're not in person and they don't hear their voice. And it's just going to be either uh, a video that's, you know, an avatar or uh, different, different ways that we can communicate via text or something that are not incorporating this, this human element. So yes, I definitely think that the lack of nonverbal communication plays a role. Uh, I just think that the general ease of not viewing the other person as a person um, is really driving the, the difficulty for having these types of conversations online, because it's just so easy to just view the text that you sent someone as just text and just attack the argument and totally ignore that there's a person behind there typing up the argument. So uh, I think it's just, it's, it, social media makes it really challenging to have these types of conversations, especially because we're incentivized also because of the algorithm, we see the most sensational stuff in our newsfeed. So we also know that there's an audience that uh, are seeing the types of uh, responses that we make. So we might be inclined to you know, be particularly inflammatory because we know that people on our side are going to applaud us. So that's like a, a whole other element that can make digital conversation really challenging. So there's definitely a lot of steps there um, and why I think that to have the most, the highest likelihood of success would be in person for sure. I have a thought. Oh, I have a, th this is interesting. I'm trying to see if I can Let's see if this works. Okay, that's no feedback, right? And everyone can hear me. I have a thought about Laura's question as well. That statistic about 80% of communication being nonverbal is a, such a widely spread statistic, and it turns out to be completely untrue. It's a misrepresentation of quite an old study that did not find that at all. And, if, and it's easy to see that it's untrue because if you think about listening to a podcast where you only hear the verbal communication or reading text where you literally have no vocal intonation or any facial expressions or anything, are we losing 80% of the meaning compared to hearing someone read out that text in front of us? No, not at all. So it turns out that nonverbal communication is massively less 
part of the communication than, than many people think. That's one of the biggest misconceptions about communication. So it's not as bad as you might think to communicate online. So Kathy has a question. Given the current political and social environment, is there any hope that Americans will go back to a common in-group identity? Big question. Um, it's definitely something that I think about a lot, and it's really hard to give a good answer. So I guess I'll, I'll start with that, because we see all of these different forces that are pushing us to be more divided. And you can think of like the macro level forces too, and the incentive structures built in our government and our political system that incentivizes polarization. I mean, the fundraising is based on polarization. And now that we've opened up these playbooks of spreading misinformation and having it be profitable, um, it could be hard to see us going back. So that's, that's the cynical view is that we're going to continue to go in this direction of polarization and filter bubbles and echo chambers. But I also think there is a growing community of people that are frustrated with that direction too. So when we know that from a lot of surveys that despite them being two extremes that make it seem like our country is very divided, there's also a lot of surveys showing that we do agree on a lot. And there is a lot that we can uh, there's a lot of bipartisan bills that we can work on. So to me, I guess I think about it in kind of two ways. It's like, yes, like the good news is that there are a lot of people frustrated by this and a lot of people that do want to focus on a common American identity and not be so sucked into these two extreme political positions. But when we still think of the macro level incentive structure, the people in power want to maintain their power and maintain the status quo because it's working for them. So I think it just requires a lot of people to, to, to change the system from the bottom up and try to reach different people, you know, like, like these steps I mentioned today, these are all one-on-one -on -one types of strategies. So if a lot of people do these together, and, and share that experience with their networks, I think it could help reduce polarization and, and understand that we're all in this together a bit more. And then the politicians might have to respond to a growing percentage of people that are not going to want to dive into this polarization. So I know that's kind of a tangent uh, but it's a really hard question to, to answer definitively because there's so many factors that I think are are in play here. So I still have some optimism that we can get through this. Um, you know, like the service like today gives me hope that a lot of people are interested in evaluating their own their own ethics. And I know that there's a lot of people thinking about these types of questions and, and wanting to advocate for a better society for everybody. So. I think this is going to be really hard and there's going to be a lot of nonlinear progress, but ultimately I do think that enough people are fighting towards a better future that there's, there's reason for hope too. That's lovely to hear. It's always good to hear hope. Louise has a question online. Do you think that people really understand the difference between facts and opinions? I think some people do. Um, I think some people don't care. Uh, and I think that's kind of one of the big issues is that ultimately, like education is a big part of it. And some people do not have the tools to delineate between fact versus opinion or even understand the, the evidence based process, like how to how to critically evaluate evidence. And that, that kind of goes in the media literacy campaigns as far as just giving people those tools to understand. But I also think a really big part of this does go back to those identity processes in that we're motivated to protect our identities. So 
there's research showing that people will share fake news on the internet, even if they know it's fake, they don't care. They want to support their identity. They want to attack the opposing group. And even if that means like, hey, I know this is fake or probably fake or just an opinion, they still might share it. So I think it really gets into trying to understand those identity processes because ultimately people want to support their group and supporting their group can often be giving them more incentive than updating their belief in some abstract argument they see online. So yeah, I think some people may not have the tools to delineate between facts versus opinion, but unfortunately I think a lot of people simply are more motivated to protect their own identity than to differentiate between the two. Thank you. Is there anyone here in the room who would like to ask a question? You would like, would anyone like to ask? If you would like to ask, you have to come to me today, sorry. Usually I would run the mic to you, but I'm also the tech guy. So I have to do the wizardry to make it work. Hi, thank you for your interesting talk. I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of the Q&A, so I'm possibly we've already covered this. In one of your slides, you said that people can struggle to even realize where their own erroneous thinking exists. Before I engage in a conversation with someone trying to convince them that they're wrong and that I'm right, I need to know that I'm right myself. If I'm holding an erroneous opinion, I need to fix that first before I worry about convincing another person. So my question to you is, is there a questionnaire or a practice or something that I can do to discover where my own unknown erroneous points of view exist? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, because yeah, like I mentioned, generally the best way to identifying your own biases is to talk to someone else who thinks differently. Uh, because, you know, even when we're trying to uncover our own biases, we still have our biases and our information seeking, right? So yeah, there's definitely different ways we can try to think through our beliefs. And um, as far as trying to match them up with the best available evidence. And this kind of goes into some of the media literacy stuff. Um, you know, one of the, the most effective strategies that's also a really straightforward practice is lateral reading. So I'm not, from, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this or not, um, but essentially it's just checking the, the sources of our information on the internet and literally thinking of laterally jumping between tabs on our browser. So if we read something from CNN, for example, instead of trying to look at the content so much, we look at the person who wrote that column and what is their background and what biases they might have. And going across the information as to what sort of motivations the people who presented the information might have so that's, that's a technique that could be helpful to just look at different types of sources if they're all coming to the same conclusion. And, and I think generally that's a good way to go is, is trying to find consensus among people who have an incentive to seek for the, the truth and don't have a, a, a bias with funding or, or politics. So that, that's one way that can be helpful is try to aggregate between a bunch of different sources and see if they're all coming to the same conclusion then generally we can feel confident in our, our beliefs being true and then have those conversations with other people. Thank you so much for that answer and for all the answers you gave today. We want to honor your time and it's coming up at half past. So I just want to thank you. I want to give everyone here the opportunity and everyone online the opportunity to thank you for spending your time with us today. Is there any last words you'd like to say before we end the call? I just want to thank you for inviting me. Yeah, it's great, great to be here. Uh, really great questions, really interesting questions. Um, I guess if anyone wants to 
ask me additional questions or follow my work, uh, they can follow me on Twitter. It's just Matthew Fossiani or my website, MatthewFossiani.com. So you can reach out to me then if you have any questions or are interested in following what I'm doing. So yeah, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I had a lot of fun. Thank you. We had a lot of fun too. And apologize to I apologize to everyone on the stream for any technical issues today. I was running the stream and I am not our stream wizard. So I was just doing my best. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. And we'll see you next week.